Chapter 22, The Procession. Before Hester Prynne could call together her thoughts and consider what was practicable to be done in this new and startling aspect of affairs, and we remember that that new and startling aspect of affairs is that Chillingworth is, um, it has uh, tickets to go on the ship with them. Um, and so he's, he's still trying to keep them in his grasp. The sound of military music was heard approaching along a contiguous street. It denoted the advance of the procession of magistrates and citizens on its way towards the meeting house, where, in compliance with a custom thus er early established and ever since observed, the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale was to deliver an election sermon. <clears throat> and then from here on down, um, I'm going to recommend that we skim um, the actual description of the, um, of the procession. Um, and so I'm going to read through it relatively quickly. Soon the head of the procession showed itself with a slow and stately march, turning a corner and making its way across the marketplace. First came the music. It comprised a, var a variety of instruments, perhaps imperfectly adapted to one another, and played with no great skill, but yet attaining the great object for which the harmony of drum and clarion addresses itself to the multitude, that of imparting a higher and more hero heroic air uh, to the scene of life that passes before the, uh, that passes before the eye. Little Pearl at first clapped her hands. I love, this is a Little Pearl characterization, which is good. But then lost, for an instance, the restless agitation that had kept her in a continual effervescence throughout the morning. She gazed silently and seemed to be borne upward like a floating seabird, and that is really good um, characterization for her again. On the long he swells of sound. Um, so here, music like, uh, like the, the ocean. But she was brought back to her former mood by the shimmer of sunshine on the weapons and bright armor in the military company, so a contrast there with the natural, which followed after the music and formed the honorary escort of the procession. This body of soldiery, which still sustains a corporate existence and marches down from the past ages with ancient and honorable fame, was composed of no mercenary materials. Its ranks were filled with gentlemen who felt the stirrings of martial impulse and sought to establish a kind of college of arms where, in an association of knights, tem knights templars, they might learn the science and, so far as peaceful exercise would teach them, the practices of war. So we're just noting there that even like the, um, the, the soldiers are only there out of interest. They're not actual soldiers. This, the high estimation then placed upon this military character might be seen in the lofty port uh, of each member of the company. Some of them, indeed, by their low services in the, by their services in the low countries and on other fields of European warfare, had fairly won their title to assume the, the, na the name and pomp of soldiership. The entire array, moreover, clad in burnished steel and with plumage nodding over their bright morions, had a brilliancy of effect which no modern display can aspire to equal. And yet, the men of civil eminence, so this is the, um, this is kind of war and this is civil, but you noticed that even the war stuff was more kind of um, a choice of how I want to look, not how I want to be. And yet the men of civil eminence, who came immediately behind the military escort, were better worth a thoughtful observer's eye. And that's interesting that it's a thoughtful observer's eye, not, uh, not just anybody. Even in outward demeanor, they showed a stamp of majesty. And again, this is all like all kinds of seeing words um, and seeming words that made the warrior's haughty stride look vulgar, if not absurd. It was an age when what we call talent had far less consideration than now. I love that. <laughs> um, but the mass of materials which produce stability and dignity of character a great deal more. I don't know if you've noticed, but there are these places of, um, of alliteration through here that kind of goes with the music that's, um, that's uh, going through here. Um, there were three or four places that you may have heard some alliteration. The people possessed, and there's another one, um, by hereditary right, the quality of reverence, which in their descendants, if it survives at all, exists in smaller proportion and with a vastly diminished force in the selection and, and estimate of pub public men. The change may be for good or ill, and is partly perhaps for both. In that day, the English settler on these rude shores, having left kings, noble, king nobles, and all degrees of awful rank behind, while still the fa faculty and necessity of reverence were strong in him, 
bestowed it on the white hair and venerable brow of age. So here we're figuring out what is esteemed um, here. On long tried integrity, um, and that makes us think of Dimmy and his uh, and and how everybody thinks that he has integrity, um, but he in the, at the same time is thinking that he's like a, an evil evil little uh, demon. On solid wisdom and sad colored experience, which is interesting because Dimsdale wouldn't agree with that sad colored experience, would he? On endowments of that grave and weighty order, which gives the idea of permanence and comes under the general definition of respectability. These primitive statesmen, I love that word, the primitive statesmen, therefore, Bradstreet, Endicott, Dudley, Bellingham, and their compeers, who were elevated to power by the early choice of the people, seem to have not often been not often brilliant, but distinguished by a ponderous sobriety rather than activity of in intellect. So again, we're just figuring out what's important to the Puritans. They had fortitude and self-reliance. This is interesting because this reminds us of Emerson, right? Self-reliance. Um, and in time of difficulty or peril, stood up for the welfare of the state like a line of cliffs against a tempestuous, tempestuous tide. And this is funny because this tempestuous tide maybe makes us think of the way that he's been uh, talking about Pearl in the last chapter in this chapter um, in terms of water, birds, and water. The traits of character here were well re representative in the square cast of countenance and large physical development of the new colonial magistrates. So far as a demeanor of natural authority was concerned, the mother country need not have been ashamed to see these foremost men of an actual democracy adopted into the House of Peers and, or made the privy council of the sovereign. Next in order to the magistrates came the young and eminently distinguished divine. And so as soon as we kind of see this young and eminently distinguished, we're thinking Dimmy, right? <laughs> um, from whose lips the religious discourse of the anniversary was expected. His was the profession at that era in which intel intellectual ability displayed itself far more than in political li life. So here, intellect, and remember we talked a long time ago about um, the, the difference between um, things that he's comparing. He's comparing civil life, he's comparing uh, like scholarship, he's talking about like intuition and nature and stuff like that. And so right now he is putting scholarship um, he's giving it to, to Dimsdale, which may not necessarily be a good thing. Four, leaving a higher motive out of the question. It all inducements powerful enough. Ooh, inducements, right? So those are like, you know, bennies. Those are the things that, uh, that we want out of the, uh, the office, not just for the sake of doing it. In the almost almost worshiping respect of the community, and this is something that uh, that many of many people noted in their answers to why is Dimsdale having this reaction to um, when he comes back to town to win the most aspiring ambition into its service, even political power, as in the case of Increase Mather, was within the grasp of a successful priest. So priesthood equals power, which is very interesting, right? Um, we often think of that as a humble position, but here it's very much a, a position of power. It was the observation of those who beheld him now that never since Mr. Dimsdale first set foot on the New England shore had he exhibited such energy, ah, there's that energy again, as, as was seen in the gait and air with which he kept his pace in the procession. I don't know if you're seeing all of the alliteration there, um, but it's, it, it's definitely hitting me as I'm reading. There was no feebleness of step, as is of other times. His frame was not bent. Notice all of these negatives, okay? Um, ways that he has been described in the past are now just literally negated. Not, not the opposite of, but just the, the negation. Nor did his hand rest ominously on his heart. And we know that that's a biggie, right? Um, yet, if the clergyman were rightly viewed, his strength seemed not of the body. It might be spiritual and imparted to him by angelic ministrations. It might be, and notice all of these mites, right? <laughs> We've got the ifs and the mites. Um, these are conditional phrases. It might be the exhilaration of that potent cordial, which distilled only in, uh, in the furnace glow of earnest and long-continued thought. Um, or perchance, 
and more conditionals. His sensitive temperament was invigorated by the loud and piercing music. And so he's giving us all of these options, and we know what it really is, right? Um, that swelled heavenward and uplifted him in its ascending wave. Notice that, that these last chapters have so much water and ocean imagery um, with tides and waves and things like that. And we want to think about, like, what does that mean? Like, maybe changing tides here, but, you know, like, there's, there's a predictability, but also, um, especially if you look at the, uh, the sailors, an unpredictability and wildness about the sea. Um, so some of, these, um, some of these words that hint to that um, can certainly be very important. Nevertheless, so abstracted was his look, it might be questioned whether Mr. Dimsdale even heard the music. There was his body moving onward with an unaccustomed force, and yet again, that neg negation. But where was his mind? Far and deep in its own region, busying itself with preternatural activity to marshal a procession of stately thoughts, and here we've got the thoughts, so we've got the scholarship again, that were soon to issue thence. And so he saw nothing, heard nothing, knew nothing. Um, and so that repetition, that parallel structure um, is, uh, is giving us, the, that's all kind of senses. And so here Hawthorne is absolutely telling us that the senses actually don't tell us anything. Um, and so by not paying attention to things, he's also not knowing anything for sure, even though he's got lots of thoughts of what was around him. But the spiritual element took up the feeble frame. And so we've got that feeble frame again. Um, yet again, that alliteration, but also reminding us how Dimsdale has always been. And carried it along, unconscious of the burden, and converting it to a spirit like itself. Men of uncommon intellect who have grown morbid. Um, and this is funny that he's not saying that it's just Dimsdale now. He's kind of universalizing this. Um, he's saying men instead of just Dimsdale. Um, but we know that, men, that Dimmy is of uncommon intellect and he has grown morbid. Um, but men like this possess this power of mighty effort into which they throw the life of many days and then are lifeless for as many more. This reminds me of Hester on the... Um, on the scaffold where it was talking about how uh, for that moment she could kind of draw on a, a whole bunch of energy um, for things to, for days to come. But when she left the, um, the prison for good, she had to just do it daily and daily and, and couldn't draw on all of that energy where you can just kind of sleep and forget it for a little while. Hester Prynne, gazing steadfastly at the clergyman, felt a dreary influence come over her. This feels very foreshadowing to me, right? Here we are, we're thinking that, that they're about to go live happily ever after. Um, and, and her first look at him is not one of, oh, there goes honey, and we're so happy that we're going to run off together. But instead, she feels a dreary influence come over her. But wherefore or whence she knew not unless that he seemed so remote from her own sphere. And remember that magical circle, that sphere um, that surrounds people, and utterly beyond her reach. One glance of recognition, she had imagined, must needs pass between them. And again, that recognition, this, this idea is going back to that uh, chapter 3, um, the recognition, um, where she and, uh, um, and Chillingworth first, uh, kind of made eye contact, um, and, and really makes, it's talking about more connection than recognition, right, that she wants, um, she had imagined that must needs pass between them. She thought of the dim forest. Oh, the dim forest. There's Dimsdale and the fact that she's not in the sun all in one tiny little word, Right? with its little dell of solitude and love and anguish, um, all three of those words going together, some better than others, right? And the mossy tree trunk where, sitting hand in hand, they had mingled their sad and passionate talk, all of these opposites in here and these contrasts, with the melancholy murmur of the brook. How deeply they had known each other then. And was this the man? She hardly knew him now. So this is a big change. And, you know, kind of, it talks a little bit of, of the complexity of people, but also like that, that he is not where she expects him to be. 
He, moving proudly past, I hope you guys are seeing all of this, uh, um, this alliteration, the melancholy murmur and the uh, proudly past, enveloped, as it were, go away, um, the rich music with the pro procession of majestic and venerable fathers. He, so unattainable in his worldly position, was still more so in that far vista of his unsympathizing thoughts. Unsympathizing thoughts. So here we're thinking um, that those thoughts come up again. Uh, through which she now beheld him. Her spirit sank with the idea that all must have been a delusion and that vividly as she had dreamed it, there could be no real bond between betwixt the clergyman and herself. So notice all of the foreshadowing here um, that uh, that he's he is taking away everything that he gave them a couple of chapters ago. And thus much of woman was there in Hester that she could scarcely forgive him. Um, and yet scarcely, so it seems that she is a little bit. Least of all now, when the heavy footstep of their approaching fate might be heard nearer, nearer, nearer. That repetition, um, that things are getting closer and closer and closer. For being, able to, for being able so completely to withdraw himself from their mutual world. Where while she groped darkly, oh she's in the dark again because she put her hair up. And stretched forth her cold hands and found him not. Pearl either saw and responded to her mother's feelings or herself felt the, and we know it's probably also herself, felt the remoteness and intangibility that had fallen around the minister. While the procession passed, the child was uneasy, fluttering up and down like a bird on the point of taking flight. Yet again, that bird, right? When the whole had gone by, she looked up into Hester's, Mother, said she, was that the same minister that kissed me by the brook? Hold thy peace, dear little Pearl, whispered the mother. We must not always talk in the marketplace of what happens to us in the forest. Oh, I love that line, right? Um, this idea of, of public spaces versus private spaces and the forest being where, um, where they were all kind of what they thought was very, very real. And now they're putting on that public face um, and uh, for, for appearances. I could not be sure that it was he, he so strange he looked, continued the child, else I would have run to him and bid him kiss me now before all the people. This is all she has ever wanted, is for these two things, the appearance and the reality, to come together, right? So while she may have been a brat in other places, it's only because she wants reality to match what, um, what appearances are even as he did yonder among the dark old trees. So again, that hidden. What would the minister have said, mother? Would he have clapped his hand over his heart? Oh, there's that hand over his heart again. And scowled on me and bid me be gone? What should he say, Pearl, answered Hester, save that it was no time to kiss, that, and that kisses are not to be given in the marketplace. And so here, like, there's this idea of time and place, but of also, like, hiding our true responses right? Well, for thee, foolish child, that, that thou didst not speak to him. Another shade of the same sentiment in reference to Mr. Dimsdale was expressed by a person whose eccentricities, or insanities, as we should term it, led her to do what, what few of the townspeople would have ventured on. Okay, so right now, we've got a person of eccentricities, or maybe even insanity, um, who can do things that other people can't do. To begin a conversation with the wearer of the scarlet letter in public, that's a big no-no, right? People don't do that. Um, she only talks to people at night and in the hidden places. It was Mistress Hibbins, per perhaps my favorite character. You guys may not love her the way that I do, but I do. Um, who, arrayed in great magnificence. So here, notice her clothes. I'm going to do a lot of characteriz characterization in uh, here um, because we're trying to figure out, like, why do the Puritans call her a witch? Um, and, and why does she own it also? Um, so here, she is dressed in great magnificence. She has a triple rutch, a ruff a bordered stomacher, a gown of rich velvet, and a gold-headed cane, which, uh, and had come forth to see the procession. So she is so far from being a normal Puritan. So she does not fit in, right? That says not. 
Um, <laughs> it doesn't look like it at all. Um, as this ancient lady had the renown, and so she's also old, and remember, though, that just a couple paragraphs ago, Hawthorne was telling us about how, how much the Puritans revere that elderness and that, um, that kind of intelligence and, and stuff that comes with age. Um, so, and had the renown, which subsequently cost her no less price than her life. So we know she's going to be killed as a witch, right? Um, and so all of these things are going to get her killed, and how does she carry it? Is she scared about it? No. Um, had the renown of being a principal actor in all the works of necromancy that were continually going forward. The crowd gave way before her and seemed to fear, I love it that they're scared of her, seemed to fear the touch of her garment, as if it carried the plague among its, among its gorgeous folds. And remember that Hester's the type of person who creates these beautiful, beautiful things, and it's also very much how she dresses Pearl. Okay? Pearl is also always attired in the really, really rich things. Um, and so we should, in this very, very spot, see some places where Pearl and Mistress Hibbins are, um, are being equated. Seen in conjunction with Hester Prynne, kindly as so many now felt to the, towards the latter, the dread inspired by Mistress Hibbins was doubled. Ooh, because she's talking to, uh, she's, she's talking to uh, Hester. And caused the general movement from that part of the marketplace in which the two women stood. We can also call this potentially a magic circle, right? And he may later, I don't remember. Um, now, what mortal imagination could conceive it, whispered the old lady confidently. Oh, confidently. Notice these, just these little adjectives that he uses that tells us why do the Puritans hate this particular person and why do they eventually need to kill her. Yonder divine man, that saint on earth, as the people uphold him to be. And so she knows, she knows that he, whoops, I, um, need him to be. That was where that was supposed to stop. Um, she knows that he's not necessarily all he seems to be, but that that's how people see him. And as I must need say, he really looks. He looks, seems, right, might be. Who now that saw him pass in the procession would think how little while it is since he went forth out of his study, chewing a Hebrew text of scripture in his mouth, I warrant, to take an airing in the forest. Ooh, an airing in the forest, right? We know that that changes people. Aha, we know what that means, Hester Prynne. Um, but truly, forsooth, I find it hard to believe him the same man. Many a church member saw I, walking behind the music, that has danced in the same measure with me. Oh, look at that. She's acknowledging that there are a lot of church members that are just like her. She just owns it. And remember, we saw in a previous chapter where, um, where Hester could see, she thought she saw all of these other people who had done wrong. Um, and here it's absolutely coming out that people who have sinned re can recognize that same kind of guilt and, um, and feeling in other people. When somebody was a fiddler, and it might have been an Indian powwow or a Lapland wizard changing hands with us. So, so in the forest um, where people can't see you, people do. Like here's the Indians and the wizards and things like that that you can touch and be friendly with. And there's a freedom to that. That is but a trifle when a woman knows the world. Ooh, when a woman knows the world. But this, is mini but this minister, couldst thou surely tell, Hester, whether he was the same man that encountered thee on the forest path? And so she also knows <laughs> about what kind of happened on that forest path and knows that uh, Demi is not the same person um, in, as, as that particular uh, person. Madam, I know not what of you uh, of what you speak," answered Hester Prynne, feeling Mistress Hibbins to be of infirm mind. Oh, even she! So this is how we know that uh, that Hester has not completely figured this out. Is that as glowingly as as Hawthorne has just painted her, um, that uh, that even Hester does not see her as um, as a person who um, who knows things and in the right ways. 
yet strangely startled and awestricken by the confidence with which she affirmed her, a personal connection between so many persons, herself among them, and the evil one. And so here we are, we're recognizing that, um, that she's owning being a, a, a witch um, because like if that's what we need to call it, it's a name, right? It's a name for, um, for these people who seem to go out and just be themselves for a little while. Um, but it, so the evil one is the Puritan kind of view of that. It is not for me to talk lightly of a learned and pious minister of the world like the, like the Reverend Mr. Dim. Fie, woman, fie, cried the old lady, shaking her finger at Hester. Oh, I love that she's scolding her. Dost thou think I have been in the forest so many times and yet have, and have yet no skill to judge who else has been there? So this is. That's that human condition that, um, that he talked about way back when. That's that, um, uh, that flame, remember, of the Holy Spirit and the, the true language. Um, of being able to understand other people's faults and hurts uh, and things like that. And that's why people seem to be drawn to Dimsdale is because they see that he also potentially has that. He has that empathy for them. Yea, though no leaf in the, of the wild garlands which they wore while they danced to be left in their hair. Oh, see, they hide it, right? They run away from it and get rid of all that stuff. She doesn't. I know thee, Hester, for I behold the token. We all may see it in the sunshine, and it glows like a red flame in the dark. We have seen him describe her scarlet letter with those same words. Remember that lurid glow that it gave when she walked back into the prison? Um, and how the sunshine, that's all anybody could see. Um, so here we're looking specifically at that token of sin that token that she's talking about. Um, but she's not just talking about the letter, she's talking about everybody's scarlet letter that we, that we all wear and we all have flaws, etc. Thou wearest it openly, so there need be no question about that. But, but, this minister, let me tell thee in thine ear, when the black man sees one of his own servants, signed and sealed, so shy of owning to the bond, as, as is the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale, he hath a way of ordering matters so that the mark shall be disclosed in the open daylight to the eyes of all the world. So hiding it is not going to, to work. And yet again, she's using the words, this idea of that it's the, the black man or the devil. Um, she's using the words that are easiest for the... Uh -oh. Um, for the um, Puritans to understand for what this means. What is it that the minister seeks to hide with his hand always over his heart? So these are the, who are the people who notice his hand over his heart? It's Pearl and Hester. I mean Pearl and, uh, and, and Hibbins. Um, those are the people who notice his, uh, um, his pain, etc. Ha, Hester Prynne. What is it, good Mistress Hibbins? Eagerly asked, eagerly asked little Pearl. See, she feels drawn to Mistress Hibbins. Hast thou seen it? And she's interested in this idea of the forest and the black man and stuff like that. Um, and, what's on, and, and what is under uh, his heart when he puts his hand over his heart. No matter, darling, responded Mistress Hibbins, making Pearl a profound reverence. Oh, and she, look at she is treating Pearl with respect. Um, which Pearl rarely gets and Pearl rarely talks to other people. Thou thyself wilt see it one time or another. They say, child, thou art of the lineage of the Prince of Air. And this is interesting because the Prince of Air could be taken as the devil, but look at how it sounds right there. The Prince of Air could also be something that feels very divine. Wilt thou ride with me? Oh, isn't that nice broomsticks and stuff? Some fine night to see thy father. Ooh, thy father, the prince of air. But also she's connecting it with Dimmy a little bit. Then thou shalt know where, wherefore the minister keeps his hand over his heart. Laughing so shrilly that the marketplace could hear her. The weird old gentlewoman took her departure. I love that he uses the word weird because it's not a word that, that he often uses, right? Um, but this is, this is how people see her. And people are like, wow, this person's really wacky. She's not wearing brown and gray and, um, and stuff like that. Like she's, she's perfectly confident, like walking up to people and talking to them about very personal matters. She is not Puritan. That is what weird means here. 
By this time, the preliminary prayer had been offered in the meeting house, and the accents of the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale were heard commencing his discourse. An irresistible feeling kept Hester near the spot. As the edifice was too much thronged to admit another auditor, she took up her position close behind this, beside the scaffold. Isn't that ironic that here she is um, right next to the scaffold of the pillory? It was in sufficient proximity to bring the whole sermon to her ears in the shape of an indistinct but varied murmur and flow of the minister's very peculiar voice. So she can't necessarily hear it word for word, but she's getting the cadence of it. This vocal organ, I, I love that he's not using voice anymore and stuff like that, right? Um, he's, he's trying to use different words. Was in itself a rich endowment, insomuch that a listener, comprehending nothing of the language in which the preacher spoke, might still have been swayed to and fro by its tone and cadence. And again, we've got that, that universal language that he talked about before. So it doesn't even matter if you understand the words. You can still understand what's going on here. Like all other music, it breathed passion and pathos, and that is not Reverend Dimmy, is it? And emotions, high or tender, that's not him either. In a tongue native to the human heart, there it is, wherever educated, so everyone, all humans, even these Puritans, Muffled as the sound was by its passage through the church walls, Hester Prynne listened with such intentness and sympathized so intimately that the sermon had throughout a meaning for her, entirely apart from its indistinguishable words. These, perhaps, if more distinctly heard, oh, here we've got ifs and mites again, might have been only a grosser medium and have clogged the spiritual sense, so it would have been bad if she actually knew the words potentially. Now she caught the low undertone, as of the wind sinking down to repose itself, then ascended with it again, ups and downs like those waves, uh, until it's, oh, I'm sorry, as, with, as it rose through progressive gradations of sweetness and power, until its volume seemed to envelop her with an atmosphere of awe and solemn grandeur. And yet, majestic as the voice sometimes became, there was forever in it an essential character of plaintiveness, um, which is helplessness and, and needing a loud or low expression of anguish, the whisper or the shriek, and that's, we, we just heard kind of a shrieking shrill laughter from the, um, from the witch, um, the whisper or the shriek, as it might be conceived, of suffering humanity, and that's that, lang that universal language, right, um, is that suffering of humanity, that touches sensibility in every bosom. So he's making it even more clear here, this empathy thing. At times, this deep strain of pathos, and we know what pathos is, right? And so he's using that word a few times there, and he knows what, what effect it has, um, was all that could be heard and scarce heard, sighing amid a desolate silence. But even when the minister's voice grew high and commanding, when it gushed irrepressibly upward, when it assumed its utmost breadth and power, so overfilling the church as to burst its way through the solid walls and diffuse itself into the open air, still, if the auditor listened intently, and for the purpose, he could detect and cry uh, the cry the same cry of pain what was it um, what we continue I'm sorry what was it the complaint of the human heart sorrow laden per perchance guilty telling its secret whether of guilt or sorrow to the great heart of mankind beseeching its sympathy or forgiveness at every moment in each accent and never in vain it was this profound and continual undertone that the clergyman gave his most appropriate power. During all this time, Hester stood statue-like at the foot of the scaffold. If the minister's voice had not kept her there, there would nevertheless have been an inevitable magnetism in that spot, whence, since, when, whence she dated the first hour of her life of ignominy. Um, so you notice that the first hour of her life almost, um, this is an entire change of life when she was on the scaffold. There was a sense within her, too ill-defined to be made a thought, but weighing heavily on her mind, that her whole orb of life, both before and after, was connected with this spot, as with, as with the one point it, that gave it unity. So we are drawing attention to the scaffold now um, as the beginning and the end. Um, and I think I'm going to stop the, um, the screencast here. Um, you'll have to make your way through this section and down. It's not all that much more, um, but definitely um, paying attention to the, um, the relationship between Pearl and the uh, Native Americans and with the, uh, the seamen here.
Um, and then, I, yeah, so, so this is, again, how she responds to Mistress Hibbins and to the ship people. Um, who, who, again, are very, very wild, et cetera. Um, so we're going back to the things that we noted in the last chapter, the wildness and how different they are. Um, and then here's our magic circle. Again, I want you to notice that when you get there, um, the magic circle of ignominy. So she was in a magic circle of light. This one's a magic circle of ignominy. Um, and so that's where we are going to uh, pick it up next time.